good evening everyone thank you for joining us for today's talk about this year's nobel prize winners for economics we have with us dr devashish mishra who is a professor of economics at the indian statistical institute new delhi his research interests include theory of auctions and mechanism design social choice theory and game theory since this year's prize winners were awarded for their contribution to the field of auction theory we only found it apt that we have professor mishra here with us to talk to us, us on this topic we are extremely excited to have you with us professor the speaker would deliver his talk for the first 45 minutes and we will then have a q and a session where we would take questions from the audience i would request the participants to type in their questions in the q and a box over to you professor thank you thank you very much for uh... inviting me um i hope i am audible so if if not then let me know okay and i hope the slides are moving yeah okay so um so i'm going to speak about uh, this year's nobel prize winners contributions uh, to auction theory so as you all probably know that uh, this year's nobel prize in economic sciences were awarded to Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson of Stanford University for improvements to auction theory and inventions of new auction formats. And uh, let me just uh, add that this is, uh, you know, somewhat the third Nobel Prize on auctions. So there have been uh, two previous Nobel prizes, which were partially given to, uh, you know, major. uh progress in auction theory so the, the 1996 prize uh, which was uh, given to merlis and bickry and and the 2007 prize which was given to purvich maskin and marson and of course not to forget uh, many other prizes given to game theory uh, which uh, basically helped the progress of auction theory and analysis of auctions Okay, so I'm I'm firstly going to uh, you know talk about how auctions are uh, you know uh, everywhere. I, those of you who uh, who listen to the Nobel Prize uh, announcement, I mean the it, the 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 announcer repeatedly said that auctions are everywhere. So indeed, I mean the practice of auctions go back to about two thousand five hundred years ago. it's used to sell many thing in in older times there were really some uh, you know repugnant uh, transactions which were made using auctions but nowadays uh, you know everyday objects like fish flowers are sold through auctions government resources are sold through auctions and this you might have uh, uh, seen in newspapers and so on you know, private resources are sold through auctions so houses are one such example uh, advertisement slots in various uh, uh, you know uh, venues uh, tv channels uh, search advertisements etc broadcast rights these are all examples of uh, uh, places where auctions are used nowadays so let me give you some uh, examples which you may not have seen or observed uh, so uh, one of the major sources of revenue for google is what they call the ad auctions uh, i think it accounts for 95% of the revenues and so here uh, i just typed on google uh, best running shoes for men and the first banner on google search page that you see is is a bunch of advertisements and so these advertisements are not necessarily the best fit for the search keyword but they are basically Uh, uh you know uh, advertisements that various companies have put up so what google does is it uh, uh, you know in real time it runs an auction to auction off these slots advertisement slots and these companies have uh, programs on google server which bid uh, as soon as you type in these keywords and uh, according to uh, a, an, an auction procedure that they have Uh, the slots are allocated to various uh, companies so this is this is one classic example of auction theory being used in uh, day to day life nowadays uh, of course there are uh, you know uh, older uh, uses of auctions even in india 
so uh, I think some of these are less well known. So one of the things that uh, here I'm pointing out is that uh, uh, Jain temples all over India have been performing uh, auctions to uh, perform rituals of various uh, religious occasions. And these auctions fetch huge amount of revenue. And, and these are what are called charity auctions. And, and these charity auctions are basically, they have a flavor of their own because, uh, you know, the bidders, bidders tend to be usually aggressive because uh, if, if you uh, donate uh, or win the auction and bid a very high amount, it adds to, uh, you know, some kind of uh, inherent uh, utility that you get by contributing to this cause and so on. So, um, so these are uh, these have been going on, and there's a literature in in in, uh, in religious studies about uh, these kind of auctions and how these are conducted. Um, there are other kinds of auctions that are documented in Indian history. For instance, th this particular example that I'm taking is uh, from uh, auctions done in 19th century. Uh, Gujarat uh, guilds of uh, uh, guilds and this is a paper written about them. So the idea here is that uh, there's a group of shopkeepers or uh, shops uh, and, and they basically, uh, you know, don't open their shops on one day, but they want to keep one of those shops open on that particular holiday. And uh, which shop will be open on, the, on, on that holiday? is determined through, through an auction procedure. And the proceeds of that auction is meant to be used uh, for various activities of the guild. Okay, so, and, and apparently this was a very common feature and it probably still is in, in, in many uh, parts of India. Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to some of these examples later as we go through the contributions of the uh, of the laureates, um, but at this time, I, I'm just giving some examples. And of course, you might be hearing a lot about BCCI, IPL, and so on. Uh, I mean, the, uh, probably you hear more about the IPL player auctions, but in fact, the broadcasting rights and media rights of uh, IPL, uh, they, they are auctioned too, and they, they are valued at very high uh, amounts. Uh, and uh, some of these things also, I mean, auctions for assets of loan default, defaulters are pretty common too. I mean, not everybody has uh, as valuable assets as uh, this gentleman, but, uh, but they are done pretty regularly too. So what I'm going to uh, do roughly is basically uh, give you, uh, you know, a basic framework uh, to think about auctions, what are auctions and uh, how do we uh, model them. And then I'm going to describe the contributions of the uh, two Nobel Prize winners. And then I'll go, go on to give you some uh, specific uh, auction formats uh, that are used in some of the practices in India. So that's the plan. So in general, you can classify auctions into two categories. Uh, sealed bid and open cry. Uh, sealed bid auctions are those where uh, bidders submit bids simultaneously to the auctioneer. And open cry auctions are those where it, it has the flavor of a price discovery mechanism. And usually in these uh, open cry auctions, uh, bidders outbid each other to win some object. And Inside each of these types, there are several variations in rules and uh, uh, different instruments used to achieve the goals of these auctions. And each of those variations are used wide, uh, uh, you know, all over the world. Uh, and, but if you just want to think about very common type of auctions, you can think of four common types of auctions. In the sealed bid category, there are two common types. One is what's called the first price and the other is second price. Uh, both these auctions essentially uh, ask bidders to submit bids simultaneously. And once the bidders submit their bid simultaneously, the highest bidder gets the object. And uh, in the first price auction, he pays the amount he has bid. 
In the second price auction, he pays the amount of the second highest bidder. Okay, so that's basically the difference between these two auction formats. And in the open cry format also, there are two uh, types uh, uh, which are very common. One is what's called the English auction. Uh, this is uh, another name for this would be an ascending price auction. And the second type is, is what's called the Dutch auction or what would be called a descending price auction. So as the name suggests, an ascending price auction, uh, again, there are uh, slight modifications of how you can implement it, but you can think of a price clock. And so the price clock essentially starts uh, the price at a, uh, from a low value. So let's say zero, and the price clock starts uh, increasing, okay? Continuously increasing at any point, uh, the bidders have the option to leave the uh, auction, and so uh, typically, as the price rises, the clock rises, uh, bidders start leaving the auction, and at some point, the price is high enough uh, so that uh, exactly one bidder remains. Okay, so as soon as the last bidder, last but one bidder drops out. Uh, the clock price clock stops and the only bidder remaining wins the object at the price specified by the clock. Okay, so this would be an English auction. Then there is a counterpart of that uh, in the descending world where you start the price clock at a very high uh, value and decrease it continuously. Uh, you know, initially because the price is very high, Nobody is interested to buy the object. And the first instance a bidder finds uh, the price to be reasonable, he presses the button and the, and the, and, and, and the price clock stops. And that's the instance, uh, whoever pressed the button and stopped the clock wins the object at, at the price uh, uh, specified by the clock. So these are the, you know, what are called standard auctions or uh, you know, common auctions. Uh, and of course, uh, so this is an example to illustrate how they, they would work. So the left uh, one is, is for a Dutch auction where the price starts at a very high amount, let's say 100. So here I'm, I'm showing this price clock to uh, drop the price in a discrete jumps, but you could have a continuous clock also. And as soon as the, the price uh, drops, at some point, let's say it's 70, one of the bidders stops the clock, which is uh, bidder two in this case. So bidder two would win the object at a price of 70, right? And uh, on, on the right, uh, you have this uh, ascending clock where we started the price at zero. And as the price keeps on increasing, bidders stop, start dropping out. And at some point, uh, let's say there are only four bidders, three of the bidders drop out. And as soon as the third bidder drops out, the clock stops. And the only bidder remaining is bidder four. And she wins the object at um, price uh, 45. So how, uh, how does it work? Do I answer the questions now or should I defer it till the end? Up to you, Professor. If you feel okay, so you want to answer because it's related to the uh, the thing that I'm, I'm discussing, let me uh, just uh, take it. So there's a question that in the Dutch auction format, what happens if more than one? Well, so so if if more than I mean because the because we are thinking uh, for simplicity that the price clock is kind of uh, uh, continuous and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, no two bidders can press the clock at the same time. So in, 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 in that sense, uh, even if two bidders have exactly the same uh, willingness to stop the clock, there would be one person who would uh, press it first and the object will go to uh, her. Uh, in the case that there is a discrete jump, if the two persons uh, press the clock, then we can do a simple lottery to determine who gets the object. Okay, so that that's basically that. Yeah, so uh, I'll come to certain variations uh, of these auctions, which will uh, answer some of the other questions that are being asked. So here are some variations. 
So uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to assume that the auctioneer is the seller. So the seller has uh, one object that uh, she is trying to sell, and there are many buyers. But you could analogously examine a setting where there is a buyer who wants to buy an object, and there are many sellers who can supply the object. And so that would be what's called the procurement auction. So think of a firm which is trying to procure a raw material for, for manufacturing. And there are many suppliers. And, and, and basically, whatever I say in this world can be essentially transported in a very dual way to, to the uh, procurement setting also. Uh, usually, you have reserve prices in auctions. So basically, the idea is that object is never sold for less than an announced price. So in the, in the Dutch auction, you can set a base price that the, the clock can never go below a certain price. In the uh, ascending auction, you can start the clock at a very, um, you know, at a reasonably high price and, and, and then from there. And in ascending, uh, sorry, in seed bid auctions, you can announce a reserve price that you only bid if your bid is above this reserve price. So reserve prices are often used and I'm not going to talk about any theory which involves uh, these variations. There are many cases there are entry fees. So if you want to participate in an auction, you have to pay a certain amount and then only you'll be allowed to participate. So uh, later in the talk, I'll give you a real example where that would be true. Uh, there are also various external factors which I will abstract away. So for instance, uh, to participate uh, and to be a bidder in an auction, you essentially need to have some investments in many settings. For instance, uh, if, you're, if you want to be a major telecom player and want to buy Spectrum, then you first invest in uh, some uh, infrastructure for Spectrum and then participate in auctions. So in some sense, entry is not at all free. Uh, there might be resale options. So once the auction is over, you may be, uh, you may be able to, um, you know, uh, resell it later. So all these things, uh, let's keep it aside. And if you're interested, you can read later. But, uh, you know, these things are also very important. But because of lack of time, I'm not going to uh, talk about them. So let me talk about the model that economists uh, uh, have in mind when they talk about auctions. So inherent in any analysis of auction is the idea that what is the value of the object for a bidder? So what is exactly value? So uh, roughly a value for an object is a bidder's willingness to pay. That is the maximum amount she is willing to pay to be indifferent between getting the object and not getting it. So that would, that's what auction theorists would call a value. It's something which is not easy to determine. I mean, usually uh, in, in all these major auctions, bidders have consultants or do their own research to find the value for the object. Uh, and, and this value for the object uh, may not be completely known to the bidders. Okay. And so two things which uh, determine how much they bid in an auction is basically what can what is their value for the object and how do others bidders behave in the auction. So, um, so both, both these things can be quite uncertain and, uh, and but both these things, I mean, how they, um, um, you know, how, how they perceive other bidders will bid in the auction and what their estimate for the value of the object would determine how much a bidder would bid in an auction. So this is a crucial element of modeling auctions that uh, both uh, the value of the object and your belief about what other bidders would do in the auction would determine how you should bid in an auction. So, Another way to summarize this is that uh, auctions, uh, you know, is an environment where bidders may potentially have a lot of uncertainty about various things. But two things at least to stand out is uh, about uh, information that other bidders might have, which may be relevant for finding out the value for the object. 
as well as actions that other bidders might take, how other bidders would behave in the auction. Okay, so often one bidder might have some information about the object that might be relevant for determining the value of the object for everyone. And I'll give concrete examples in a minute about this. And also bidder may have very little idea about uh, the, uh, the other bidders. The other bidders might be super aggressive or very conservative. And, and how each bidder perceives uh, these uncertainty and what kind of belief he has about this would determine uh, their bidding behavior. All these things are form were formally uh, uh, formulated uh, in a couple of classic papers by Harsani uh, in a very broad framework uh, in, in game theory. And uh, those of you who are familiar with this, he formulated the idea of a Bayesian game and a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. And that basically opened the door to formally model and study auctions because auctions are one thing which fit very nicely into this framework of Harsani, where uh, you can analyze such uh, uh, environments with uncertainty. And in fact, uh, the uh, uh, auction theory was one of the first applications of uh, Harsani's uh, um, uh, Bayesian games. So even though auctions have existed for 2,500 years, at least uh, uh, their formal analysis is uh, pretty recent. Uh, in that sense. And it's only after the development of game theoretic tools that we could properly analyze these settings. So, uh, so in the next, so how am I, right. Okay, so in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, one model of auctions, uh, which is uh, kind of a precursor to the auction models that were used by this year's uh, winners which we call the independent private values model auctions. So these are usually, these kind of models are used to analyze auctions such as art auctions. And so, uh, so, the, uh, so the idea is the following. Suppose I'm, uh, I'm a bidder in an art auction. So I want to buy a piece of art. And uh, this piece of art is only, uh, you know, I'm going to use it for my personal purposes. I'm not going to resell it later. So my value or my willingness to pay for this piece of art would depend on how I personally assess its uh, value. So it has nothing to do with what others think about the art piece. And, and in these settings, it's perfectly reasonable to assume that uh, when I am a bidder, I enter the auction to buy such an art, I have a pretty good understanding of uh, what the value of the object is. And so, uh, so, so auction theorists would uh, generally model this as each bidder uh, independently and privately knows uh, what the value of the object is. Uh, uh, so in this case, the art piece. And of course, my value for the art piece is only known to me. It's not known to the auctioneer. It's not known to the other bidders. Okay. And uh, so that's the uncertainty and, and uh, the analysis of these uh, settings would, uh, would be, uh, you know, would rely on uh, Hassani's toolkit uh, in some sense. So, uh, so the equilibrium analysis where equilibrium basically means the Beige Nash equilibrium that Hassani proposed uh, was done by Vikri in his uh, seminal 1967 paper for which he was awarded the Nobel prize. And uh, in the independent private values model, uh, so he, what he did was he he analyzed what should bidders behave, how should be bidders behave in equilibrium in first price and second price auction. So the uh, so so what he showed is that in first price auctions, bidders should uh, shade their bids below their value, so they should bid uh, uh, whatever their value is, they should lower it and bid. Uh, slightly lower than the value. In second price auction, bidders should just bid their value. So the intuition for that is that in second price auction, you're anyway paying the uh, second highest bid. So, uh, so there is some profit margin embedded in the rules of the auction itself. 
in first price auction it would be foolish to bid your value because that would give you just a zero profit so in case you win so it's uh, naturally you shared your bid a little bit so the uh, contribution of vikri is to show that uh, this this happens in an equilibrium and to uh, you know formally uh, uh, give a, an expression for how much the bid should be and how much the bid shedding should be and so on so uh, so he, uh, so vikri goes on and computes the expected revenue in both the auctions in in the ipv model and shows that uh, even though the, these two auction formats look very different to start with under the independent private values model where bidders exactly know what their values are the expected revenue in both auctions are the same so remember it's the expected revenue which is the same that is before the start of the auction when the auctioneer does not know anything about how much the bidders will bid what their values are and so on and so forth if he formed expectations uh, about what the prices would be then the expected revenue in first price and the second price auctions would be the same and uh, of course the realized outcomes would be uh, potentially quite different remember uh, you know the the revenue that gets generated in an auction is essentially a random variable and here we are just looking at the expected value of that random variable but the exact realizations of that random variable might be quite different so there might be an auction uh, you know an instance of an auction where first price auction might yield very high revenue but second price may not and there might be some instances where the reverse is true so uh, but what this result of vikri is saying that in expectation these two things would be the same uh, so in fact you can uh, you can ask that why we care about expected revenue why not something else why don't we look at the variance in revenue in these two options well you can do that uh, but it looks like expected revenue is something that is uh, more plausible to look at in, in this context if you were to look at the variation in revenue in both the auctions in fact the first price auction has less variation than the second price auction so this is something you can in fact uh, establish uh, rigorously that in the independent private values model the first price auction has less variation than the second price auction even though the expected values of these revenues are the same so this was vikri uh and uh, so you must be thinking that i i only talked about first price and second price so what about the ascending price and descending price auction well it turns out uh, uh, the ascending price auction is equivalent to the second price auction in the independent private values case so let's look at this example suppose i have four bidders let so and these are the values v1 to v4 and suppose they are participating in an uh, english auction so remember english auction is something where the price starts in zero and it keeps on increasing so so what would uh, you know what would buyer one do so buyer one has a value 10 for the object it's foolish for buyer one to drop out of the auction before the price hits 10 because may, remember he does not know the values of the other bidders so he has no idea that the, there are other bidders who have very high values than him so so by dropping out earlier he may have won the auction he does not know but by dropping out he gets uh, nothing so uh, he might as well stay till the price hits 10 but after price hits 10 he has no incentive to stay in the auction because if he stays then essentially uh, you know even if he wins he will pay a price which is higher than the value so his uh, payoff is going to be negative so in fact uh, this is exactly the reason that every buyer will drop out exactly uh, at a point when the price hits the value so buyer one drops at 10 buyer two drops at 20 and buyer three drops at 30 now remember when does the english auction stop the english auction stops as as soon as exactly one bidder is left in the auction so in this case it will stop at 30 because only buyer 4 remains in the auction 
So, and the price he pays is exactly 30 because that's when the clock will stop. But notice that this is exactly the second highest uh, value uh, in, in, this in this particular instance. So the payment, uh, you know, uh, the, the payment of the winner in this case is exactly the second highest value that would have happened in the second price auction. So, so in this sense, the second price and the English auctions are the same in this model. Uh, you can make a similar argument that the first price and the Dutch auctions are also strategically the same uh, auction format. So as soon as, um, you know, as long as we talk about first price and second price, we are uh, equivalently talking about uh, Dutch auction and English auction also. Uh, as an aside, uh, uh, you might ask that, uh, well, all these auction formats are nice, but maybe I can design a new auction format which will do better in terms of expected revenue than these. Uh, well, Myerson showed that uh, not really. In fact, a Vickery auction with a suitably chosen reserve price will give you uh, the highest expected revenue amongst uh, all possible auction formats. So think of any auction formats, uh, the Vickery with a suitably chosen reserve price uh, will beat everything in terms of expected revenue. Okay, so uh, some other day I will tell you why a reserve price is required, but today, Let's move on. So now let me, uh, you know, come to the contribution or the model of the winners of this year's auction. So, uh, so, th so this year's auction uh, winners thought of a different model where uh, the value of the object is not completely known to the bidders. So think of uh, uh, auctions of mining rights of mines. Okay. So uh, different bidders will have uh, different estimates of the mine. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, the value of the mine will depend on the amount of minerals that's there in the auction. And it, it's common to everyone. So independent of uh, who wins the auction, uh, they would probably generate the same value uh, because the amount of uh, uh, you know, minerals in it is common. Uh, but at the time of participating in the auction, they don't have a precise estimate of this value. So different bidders have different information about it. So different bidders have hired different consultants uh, to, uh, you know, do various uh, geological surveys about it. Uh, they have access to different kinds of data, but uh, those estimates might differ. But at the end of the day, they all have the same value. So there are two things in this model. One is that bidders are uncertain about this common value and essentially the value is common. So at the end of the day, they're all going to get this common value. So how should bidders bid in these auctions? So this is where, uh, you know, the Wilson and Milgram's papers are uh, research uh, has uh, contributed. And so, uh, so Wilson's uh, papers in 1967 and 1969 were the first to think about uh, these kind of auction models where there is uh, um, uh, a common value component that is everybody values the object the same way. And basically different bidders have different information about the object, okay? And uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, the, uh, the background to this is that uh, uh, exactly at this time, there was a lot of uh, mining auctions in, in US and, and many of these bidders were making uh, um, a huge losses by overbidding, you know, bidding much more than what, what the uh, second highest bidder was bidding, let's say, and, and the actual value is. And so, uh, so the, the, this motivated Wilson's uh, study of these kind of auctions. And, uh, and, and uh, let me say that this model will not fit an art auction, for instance, you know. Uh, it will fit an art auction if uh, all the bidders cared only about reselling the art piece, where they would have the common value of the market price for that art piece. But it would not fit if every bidder only cared about their own consumption, right? 
So back to the uh, common value case. So in this case, how would bidders bet? So Wilson's analysis was along this line that suppose everybody bid according to their expected value. So they, they don't have any precise estimate of it, but based on the information that they have, uh, you know, they form an estimate, which is just uh, expected value of that object conditional on what information I have. And suppose if everybody is, uh, you know, all the bidders are of the same type and followed similar strategies that, uh, you know, given the same information, they would behave the same way, uh, then winner will be the one with the highest signal. Okay, but if winner is the one with the highest signal, then winning will bring some kind of a bad news. Why is that? Because winner's expected value of the object uh, conditional on other signal being lower than hers will be lower than the unconditional expectation. So before he participated in the auction, he had no idea about others estimate, I mean other signal, but once he won the auction, he realizes that, well, everybody else has a, a signal which is lower than mine. So the, so this conditional expectation would be lower than the earlier unconditional expectation. So, uh, so uh, after winning, the bidder is kind of, uh, uh, you know, is in a bad uh, mood because uh, now his exposed uh, expected value of, of the object is lower than the expected value that he thought it would be before bidding. So this is what uh, Wilson called the winner's curse. And this is exactly the idea that you, you fail to foresee this, that uh, the uh, expected value after winning would be lower than the expected value before participating in the auction. And uh, so of course, what Wilson suggested is that uh, if, you're, uh, if the bidders are bidding in an equilibrium, bidders should take this winner's curse into account. And so they should not bid according to their expected value from uh, um, before participating, but they should uh, share their bids downwards from that. So in equilibrium, bidders would bid much lower than that, should bid much lower than that. In, uh, and so the winner's curse cannot happen as an equilibrium phenomenon. And so uh, Wilson was the first one to think about it and in, in a common values model uh, in a first price auction. So he, he shows that uh, you should lower your, uh, you know, you should not bid as aggressively than in an usual auction because you want to keep your profit margins low, which is there in independent private values model also, but to also offset the winner's curse. Okay, so, so there are two effects that will drive down the aggressive nature of bidding. And so uh, even in India, you see some of these, uh, you know, winner's curse happening in many auctions. So here is a here is an auction uh, uh, from 1995. So these are the telephone rights auction. So before 1995, there was uh, a monopoly about, uh, you know, telephone supplies in India. And, but in 1995, there was an auction held to determine who could uh, uh, um, supply telephone uh, connections and uh, different states were auctioned and, uh, you see that uh, uh, there, there is one company uh, which basically won nine out of 13 licenses. And this was a kind of an unheard company. It's called uh, uh, Himachal uh, Frontiers Communications Limited, I think. And basically uh, they bid huge amounts compared to the second highest bid. So here I have just written down the ratios and this is just a reflection that uh, you know you know the amount required to win in the auction was much higher uh, you know the amount required to win in the auction is much lower than what these guys had paid in many of the states and so this is one example where uh, you can say that uh, they did not bid according to the equilibrium and essentially uh, it results in uh, winners curse so you do see these kind of winners curves in many of the auctions. And so, uh, so this, this was Wilson. So what did uh, Milgram do? 
So Milgram said that, well, this uh, independent private values of victory is one extreme where everybody perfectly knows their own value. Uh, and then this uh, Wilson's model is another extreme where there's a common value, but nobody is uh, uh, sure about that. So most real life models would have both these components. And uh, so, uh, so the classic paper of Milgram, which is the Milgram and Weber paper, basically uh, proposes a general model, which has this uh, independent private values and common values as a special case. So their question was, uh, what are the equilibria and revenue rankings of standard auctions in these models? So let me just motivate uh, why we should care about these uh, intermediate models of uh, uh, interdependent values. Uh, so let's go back to that Gujarat Guild auction. So let's say there are four shops uh, in, the, in the Guild. So there are two medicine shops and two bookshops. And uh, the auction is to open exactly one of these shops uh, for, for, for the holiday. Okay. Now, in the extreme case, we would assume that, uh, you know, every medicine shop knows exactly the value uh, of keeping its shop open. Okay. Uh, in the common value case, uh, the assumption is that uh, everybody would receive the same value by keeping the shop open. So none of these assumptions is exactly going to fit this model because uh, think of the medicine shop. Well, because there are two medicine shops, uh, the value of the medicine shop will depend on its own demand. So how much demand he receives. So that's his private information, but also the demand of the other medicine shop. That is usually what is the demand that the other medicine shop has. And so that's something which is uncertain to him, but it will not depend on the demand of the bookshops because the, usually the consumers of the bookshops are not coming to the medicine shop. So there is uh, some interdependence in this model. The medicine shop cares about the other medicine shops, uh, private information, which is the demand, but it does not care about the bookshops uh, demand. Okay. And uh, there is no common component in the sense that the uh, value of the bookshop and the medicine shops uh, are going to be quite different. Although the, the two medicine shops would have a common value. But across the two medicine and bookshop, there might be uh, totally different values. So it's neither completely private values, not completely common value. So these are the kind of, uh, uh, you know, examples that Milgram and Weber had in mind. So that's what, uh, uh, you know, they uh, wanted to look at and, and generalize. So their contribution is to analyze the equilibria of uh, bidders or behavior of bidders in first price, second price and English auctions. And those, they, they basically uh, did the, uh, what Vikri did for independent private values. They specified the equilibrium behavior. They provided a revenue ranking of these three auctions under some assumptions of uh, distributions of signals. Uh, that's uh, not so important. So, uh, so, so what they showed is that the expected revenue from these auctions, unlike in the independent private values case, can be quite different. In particular, the English auction would generate the highest expected revenue, followed by the second price auction, followed by the first price auction. So, so the intuition for this is that because my value is uncertain and it depends on the information held by the other bidders, in the uh, shop example, the one medicine shop's value would depend on the information of the other medicine shop. It's important that auctions reveal, uh, you know, as much information as possible during the auctioning process. So in particular, in the English auction, as the bidders drop out in, during the auction, it reveals some information about uh, what the private information of the bidders who are dropping out. And that can be used by the bidders who are staying along to infer more precisely the estimated value. Okay, so the estimation of staying in the auction gets better as, as you keep going uh, in the auction. In, in first price and second price, you don't get uh, uh, these extra information that English auction provides. So that's the rough intuition why English auction would do better in an environment where there is some kind of interdependence. 
so they formalize this with uh, with this idea that uh, what they call the linkage principle it basically says that auctions which uh, you know link a bidder's payment to more information in the market basically do better in terms of expected revenue it reduces winners curse and encourages aggressive bidding so uh, the, so uh, so i'm almost out of time so let me just spend uh, five minutes uh, explaining the other contributions of the of the two winners uh, so uh, all of this would be uh, you know quite uh, uh, surprising to some of you if you did not study game theory before and in fact before game theory the idea was that you know perfect markets would just discover prices and we don't need to conduct these auctions and so on uh, in fact uh, you know if, if you uh, uh, know a little bit of general equilibrium the idea is that uh, you can discover prices by just starting at arbitrary initial prices and then adjusting these prices iteratively by looking at demand and supply and stopping at a point where demand equals supply uh, well the crucial assumption in these kind of price discoveries is that agents are not strategic and goods are divisible so these two assumptions are very important to uh, apply these kind of equilibrium analysis uh, general equilibrium analysis uh, you can think of this price discovery in english auction, auctions as overcoming this problem of strategic uncertainty and uh, even it does not require that goods should be divisible so that's that's how you should view these contributions to be so they kind of uh, proposed uh, and analyzed uh, uh, price discovery mechanisms with strategic uh, agents okay and so uh, uh, later they extend these analysis to some extent to selling multiple objects so these are much more complicated auctions where uh, potentially divisible goods can be sold and there might be a common value component there might be private value component and in particular milgram and wilson recommended uh, to uh, to to fcc which is the regulatory body of uh, allocating spectrums and uh, uh, bandwidths for various kinds of communications uh, they they proposed uh, uh, a price discovery mechanism for doing these things for multiple objects so there the focus of their analysis is more uh, on efficiency rather than revenue maximization um, so uh, so let me give one example at least uh, what kind of problems you can have in thinking about these kinds of auctions so let's say you, instead of one object now you have two objects object a object a and object b so think of object a is uh, uh, a house at some uh, some place and object b is another house at some place and a potential bidder can buy both the houses or one of the houses but there is one bidder uh, who is not interested in buying one house so one house is useless uh, for it so he is only interested to buy both the houses so he, this these are the values of the bidders and let's assume independent private values so in this case uh, you know bidder one knows that her value for both the objects combined is 10 but uh, uh, for each individual object is just 5 and 5 for bidder two so bidder two is kind of only interested in one object if you give him both he only uses one okay so in these kind of auctions what would happen if i conduct auction of object a separately and then object b well what may happen is that uh, for instance uh, you know uh, 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 there might be what uh, uh, milgram would call an exposure problem and uh, what can happen is like bidder one bids aggressively on object a and wins Uh, but for object b he, he is not able to bid aggressively because he has already bid for object a so he is defeated in object b by bidder 2 so in this case bidder 1 is now stuck with object a even though he has no value for object a so he was hoping to win object b later but because he bid aggressively and won object a he could not uh, compensate that now uh, in the object b option so these kind of uh, 
uh, you know, problems can arise if you have independent options of objects A and B. And so that's what uh, uh, Milgram, uh, you know, proposed to the FCC that you should, uh, uh, you know, auction these multiple objects simultaneously. And so what he proposed is that uh, all these simultaneous uh, uh, auctions would require that bidders submit bids not only for object A and object B, but also for objects A plus B. Because in principle, they can have, uh, uh, you know, synergies. These objects can be synergetic like for uh, bidder one, or they can be substitute like for bidder two. So these combinatorial auctions have seen enormous applications. So spectrum is something you might have heard about, but these are these other options like bus routes in London, uh, transportation in routes in Chile and airport slots in US. So just as an example, suppose I'm selling airport slots in Delhi and Mumbai, let's say, okay, simultaneously. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm an uh, airlines, if I'm given an airport slot in Delhi at nine o'clock and another airport slot in Mumbai at 11 o'clock, probably I will, uh, these two slots will be highly complementarity uh, for me because uh, uh, they bring synergy in the sense that if a plane departs from Delhi at that time and will land in Mumbai, then I will have to use a slot in Mumbai. But on the other hand, an airline, you know, if I look at the same airport, the two slots at the same time may not be of so much value. So they would rather be uh, substitutes for me. So the, these are the, um, you know, so the questions addressed by Milgram and Wilson uh, was uh, a proposal that how would you do a price discovery like an English auction when there are multiple objects. And so they, along with uh, Preston McAfee, who is also a famous auction theorist, proposed what, what they uh, called at that time simultaneous multi-round auction. And uh, now various variants of it, uh, uh, now called the combinatorial clock auction, is used all over the world to sell spectrum. Uh, theoretical results in this are limited. So most of these, uh, you know, auction proposals are heuristics. Uh, they have been uh, tested against uh, some kind of data and simulations. But there is a theoretical analysis of these auctions are very difficult. Uh, so unlike the Milgram, Weber, or Vickery's auction analysis, or Wilson's common value auction analysis, it's very difficult to do a game theoretic analysis of these auctions. Uh, so uh, in two minutes, I'm going to end in two minutes. Uh, so I'm going to just give you some examples of auctions uh, done by the government in, in various settings. Um, so, in, so as I said, uh, not always the auctioneer is the seller. There are many settings where the auctioneer is the buyer. And one important uh, setting where procurement happens, which is relevant today, is vaccine procurement. So, so vaccine procurement is usually done using what's called uh, a reverse auction. And so, uh, so that's very common. And we, uh, I already talked about spectrum auctions. So uh, these are complicated auctions, some variations of uh, Milgram and Wilson's uh, uh, combinatorial clock auctions are used. Uh, then there are auctions to uh, sell emission rights to various firms. So government usually has a quota of emission and it sells these rights to various companies using auctions. And these are usually divisible goods. So these uh, you know, emission rights are basically some quantity of emission that you allow to a firm. And, uh, and the, the bids in these auctions are more complicated in the sense that bidders can submit a price and a quantity pair um, you know, uh, at which they want to buy these uh, emissions. And uh, so these are some of the auctions. Um, I mean, one auction format, which is uh, quite publicly available and which you can go and look at the Ministry of Coal website is the coal mine auction. So this is pretty recent. So government of India recently started after a Supreme Court order uh, auctioning the right to mine some of the uh, coal mines and these are multiple coal mines I mean, my understanding of these auctions is that still these auctions are not held simultaneously unlike Milgram and Wilson's uh, recommendations so they hold these uh, auctions uh, quite independently of all the mines 
but one important feature which is uh, in, uh, used in these auctions is interesting is that the bidding does not happen uh, is not on the amount you pay for the mining rights but a share of the revenue so you bid on the percentage of revenue that you would share with the government so these are what are called royalties so the bidding happens on royalties and uh, uh, there is also a significant participation fee for these auctions which is non refundable and uh, there are upfront payments and usually these kind of auctions uh, you know first round there is a technical bid and based on the technical bid you qualify for bidding in the second round where you bid on the lower royalty and so on so these are quite uh, complicated procedures in that sense but notice that this is uh, this is a setting which fits more with the common values model of uh, wilson the amount of coal in a mine is basically common to everyone the value for that is common to everyone of course different uh, you know miners will have different estimates for that and uh, it's interesting that uh, now the bidding is happening on the royalty uh, aspect and 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 not uh, on on uh, how much you would pay lump sum okay so concluding thought uh, basically that milgram and wilson contribution to uh, uh, economics is not only on auction theory but goes more uh, beyond that they have contributed immensely to other areas of economics also especially to game theory and reputations and information economics uh, but uh, i mean i mean i have just given you a very one on one lecture on this but the beauty of their contribution lies in appreciating the modeling choices that they have made and the predictive power of these modeling choices and um, so one particular take take away that i would like you to uh, take from this talk is that uh, you know many a times uh, people criticize that auction generated very low revenue you know uh, and uh, what is uh, milgram and wilson saying that english auction will generate the highest revenue um, look at this that this is generating low revenue the point is that what they are saying is that these auction generate higher expected revenue so of course there will be instances where these auctions will generate low revenue and there will be instances where it will generate high revenues but on average english auction will do better so that's the message so it's unfair to criticize that uh, auctions fail because in some instance it did not work and of course uh, uh, you know real life auctions are much more com complicated and and there are other kinds of concerns uh, i already told you that multi object auctions have this exposure problem other kinds of problem some of this is alleviated by these uh, uh, designs of uh, milgram and wilson but they are not exactly uh, you know full proof they are still heuristics and auction theory is still working on these things and there are other kinds of uh, things that uh, auction theory is having to uh, look at and uh, we should uh, Uh, we should be aware of that so here are some references if you want to go back and uh, study some of this uh, the classic uh, book which is uh, somewhat of a technical book is uh, by vijay krishna uh, on auction theory uh, the comprehensive bible for these things is uh, this edited book by crampton shoham and steinberg it's called combinatorial auction it also covers single object auctions the models of milgram weber and wilson um there are these two books by milgram and klemperer um so uh, both milgram and klemperer are students of uh, bob wilson and so they have also written uh, very useful books uh, on auction theory so they are also uh, uh, very good references let me stop here sorry i overshot uh, by some time i i hope it was useful i'm happy to take more questions if you have uh thank you so much professor that was extremely uh, informative and helpful i had a great time um we have one question uh, right now that i'd like to ask you so the question is how are these models helpful in conducting government auctions where the motive of the auctioneer that is the government would be to maximize social welfare along with profit of the winner the social uh, welfare here um, 
it corresponds to probably better quality products or lower prices for the consumers or the amount of pollution yeah so um so all these pay, although i uh, the first part of the uh, contributions of wilson and uh, milgram and weber i talked about uh, you know expected revenue maximization as the objective all these papers also talk about social welfare and uh, uh, at least in their models uh, all these options would maximize social welfare okay, so so they would uh, uh, maximize social welfare because of the modeling choices they make uh, of course the real world uh, options are may not fit the modeling choices they make so here i had some examples so for instance uh, look at uh, the uh, the second bullet here entry concerns so usually the idea of auctions is that it encourages competition so bidders outbid each other and and basically the price is raised and you discover price but the effect of that is that the profit of the bidders are pretty low because they outbid each other but now think of a setting like uh, spectrum for instance usually bidders would borrow from banks or, or uh, invest in infrastructure before participating in auction so they they would already have huge amount of debts and these kind of auction procedures which encourages competition may not be super ideal for this setting so we need to think carefully about uh, uh, and so what would happen is the uh, is that what has been happening in the spectrum sector in india especially that uh, basically at the end of the day these uh, spectrum i mean those who win the spectrum are not able to provide the right infrastructure because they have just spent everything on acquiring the spectrum and there is nothing left for them to invest in better technology later on and so so these kind of concerns are always there and and uh, you know i think auction theory is still searching for the right model to analyze these kind of settings so there is some literature on this um but the milgram and weber's models the ones they consider in their models welfare is not a concern because all these options would be welfare equivalent and maximize the planners welfare of course they don't have these concerns that i'm pointing out here and once you bring in these concerns i mean we need to relook at these options and how they would perform for instance if these kind of entry concerns are there they, it might be profitable to uh have lesser number of bidders participating and lowering the competition a little bit so that the prices are lower and basically that encourages uh, bidders to invest later in technologies and so on so so these kind of uh, you know these are hard problems and and, and i think uh you know uh, especially with these kind of settings so uh, auction uh you know um, theorists are still looking for answers on that yeah but great question great question uh thanks professor uh, if any of you have any other questions you can either put them in the chat box now or you can also um uh, like ask to be asked i can unmute you if you want to ask your questions so we But can probably wait for another one to two i see which i haven't answered i think which is that if seller declares a reserve price won't all buyers bid at that price will not necessarily right because if there are multiple buyers who have a, a value or estimated value above it they would just uh, you know try to outbid each other and, uh, and and in the process if i bid just at the reserve price i would always be skeptical that somebody else would bid above me and win the object so in equilibrium you won't see that everybody bids the reserve price Okay, so there is a uh, question that can one account for syndicates and auctions? Yeah, I mean for sure. I mean uh, th there is uh, there is a literature on auctions on uh, auction syndicates. So these are basically auction theorists would call it collusion. Uh, so basically, a group of bidders get together and collude and participate in auction, which is usually uh, seen in many auctions. And there are uh proposals for auctions which try to minimize collusion uh, uh 
one idea is like how do you detect collusion if you have a sealed bid auction it's very difficult to detect collusion because all you see is one time bids but if you have a iterative price discovery mechanism then the collusion is easier to detect so that would be uh, an answer from from milgram and uh, wilson for instance and that would be a rational to use a price discovery auction mechanism rather than a sealed bid mechanism but i should point out that there is a thorough theoretical analysis equilibrium analysis of auctions where collusion might be uh, uh, possible and uh, one of milgram students yen kuche is a pioneer in that so if you want to look for papers or analysis of uh, auctions with collusion you should search for yen kuche uh, his papers and so on. Okay, so there's a question. It's a great question. What is a reverse auction exactly? So reverse auctions are basically, you know, it's in a world dual to the world that I described, where the auctioneer is the buyer, okay, and the sellers are participating in the auction. So sellers have cost of supplying an object, so they have to manufacture, uh, you know, uh, an object and and give it to the buyer. so basically the buyer in the auction would determine how much he would pay to the seller winning seller so usually what would happen is he will announce a very high uh, payment that he would make so at that very high payment everybody would be interested to supply and then he would continuously lower the price so that exactly one supplier is willing to supply at that price right and so you you can think of it as the reverse of the english auction because now you know uh, the bidders are suppliers and they have costs so you need to pay them instead of the english auction where the bidders are the buyers where they pay the seller okay so so that's 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 what uh, reverse auction and reverse auctions are very popular in procurement where buyer is the auctioneer and sellers are the bidders so there's one more question yeah Or two more, sorry. Yeah, so let me answer the second one. Is auction theory one of the few branches of game theory where the theoretical predictions are actually realized in reality? As many of the game theory predictions are usually empirically violated. That's a great question. I I don't have a lot of sense for it, but let me say that there's a huge literature on empirical auctions, and this is, uh, I mean, uh, one of the reasons that the Milgram, Weber, or Wilson. Uh, the research is so important because it opened uh, the door for empirical analysis of auctions so once there is a theoretical model uh, and there is a theoretical prediction uh, that's when the empirical uh, research is coming and go to the real life take data and try to establish that these theoretical predictions are robust or not and in fact that was done in uh, in fact most of this uh, empirical studies are for like us timber auctions or us uh, procurement uh, or us auctions for you know uh, co giving contracts to various highway tracks and so on so, uh, so so these these auctions are very regularly collected and there is huge amount of data in that and so basically there is a huge empirical research uh, where they uh, try to establish is whether the bidding behavior predicted by milgram weber or wilson or vickery is consistent with in these kind of uh, empirical data I, i'm not an expert in that but if you're interested uh, i mean there's a huge literature on this also so you should uh, look at it i cannot say concretely whether they match with the uh, theoretical predictions by but, but i presume that uh, in many cases it does okay so There is another question by Pranav, which says that uh, reserve is it just to ensure that a minimum value is paid? Well, reserve prices uh, play an important role in jacking up the revenue. So let me give an example. Uh, so the example is uh, the following. Suppose I am uh, I am an auctioneer. Let's look at the private values case. There is an auctioneer. There are two bidders, and they have private values. so i don't know their private values i am an auctioneer everybody knows their own values but what i know is that their values are drawn from 0 1 uniformly at random so it's some number between 0 and 1 uniformly at random so if i just know this and i conduct an auction 
what would be my expected revenue let's say i conduct an english auction so i know that in Engli english auction where the prices keep on increasing and i stop at the second highest uh, value right so it would be uh, the expected value of the second highest of two random draws from zero one right and if you know a little bit of statistics that expected value is actually one third so in expectation the auctioneer would think that an english auction where two bidders are drawing uniformly at random with uh, their values from zero one would generate an expected value of one third right but now uh, let's say that i set a reserve price of 0.5 so what does the reserve price of 0.5 do well i only sell the object when the values of at least one of the bidders is more than 0.5 okay so i start my clock at 0.5 so whenever the object is sold i'm guaranteed that i will get 0.5 but the disadvantage is that which is larger than 1 by 3 by the way but the disadvantage of that that there are many cases where the values of both the bidders would be less than 0.5 and i will not be able to sell because the auction clock would not just move but the probability of that is very low because it's just 1 by 4 right the uh, probability that both of them would have value less than 0.5 so in this case by setting a reserve price of 0.5 i'm able to increase my expected revenue so the reserve price although sometimes it will generate zero revenue but at some times it will generate very high revenue because uh, uh, you know uh, i will al always be guaranteed 0.5 revenue so in expectation the pri uh, expected price would go up so that's the role of reserve price usually in auctions okay uh, if there are no other questions i think we can wrap up the session now thank you so much for speaking to us today professor and thanks to the audience also for asking your questions um you can check out our previous talks on our uh, youtube channel and we'll be having a few more talks in the future as well again thank you so much professor for being with us today thank you very much thank you it was nice thank you thank you so much